take it away, Steve. Thank you, uh, uh, Debbie. Uh, we're looking at the long year, of essentially the two periods of time, uh, and this is a, a, um, pretty much uh, specific to uh, our region uh, of the United States. So the period that we're interested in is this August, September, October, November area. So what we're gonna be talking about today is, is seeding or overseeding. Uh, if you wanna put down sod, this is also the time of the year to do it. We'll talk a little bit about fertilization, uh, liming, uh, which uh, I can't talk about liming unless we talk about soil samples. So we'll talk a little bit about soil samples. Uh, other things that we can do at this period of time or optimal to do this period of time is dethatching and aerating. These, this is specific to people who may have heavier clay or soils. Uh, we'll also talk about um, uh, broadleaf and some weed control. Also, I'm going to do a little bit, it's an experiment, a little bit of a, an IPM, an integrated pest management exercise on what, what I usually get a lot of questions about and that's wiregrass. Uh, or the Bermuda cultivar that we call in this region wiregrass. Um, so let's uh, take a look at um, the uh, um, soil testing and why we do it. Now soil testing essentially should be done in the spring or the fall, but the information that comes back from your soil sample will guide you or should guide you to that next period of lawn care, either the spring or the fall. So what you do in the spring affects how your lawn or what you can do in the fall. And the same goes with the fall and into the spring. That's the, royal, that's the role of soil testing. Here is the presentation on the screen of my first uh, soil sample when I first moved back here back in 20, 2011. Um, you'll notice that the first number at the top, and my pointer is pointing to it, is pH, probably the most important number. This is a number that you must know in order to, to care for your lawn. The pH determines how much nitrogen your soil will accept. Uh, it also determines the amount of P or K that you will need. Also, the other two numbers, the P and K, the phosphorus and the potassium, are essential for the, the growth of roots and, and uh, 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 leaves of, of your lawn. Also, uh, the numbers here for magnesium and calcium uh, are important too because these are two quantities which determine what type of lime you may need. If your, M, if your MG, your magnesium and your calcium numbers are like mine here, uh, into the optimum range, then you don't really need dolomitic lime, which contains more magnesium and calcium. Uh, I know I may go through this too quickly, but when you get your soil sample, especially uh, for uh, putting in a lawn, you will get back this and notice down here at the bottom, this is a very important part. It will tell you what you need to do and obviously the number one here is apply and work in by spading, plowing or rototilling 25 pounds of ground limestone per 1,000 square feet. Why? I needed this pH number to increase. It needed to be closer to neutral, closer to seven on the pH scale. That will allow more nutrients to be used by my soil. And the more nutrients used by your soil, the more your plant can grow, your roots will, fl will flourish. Also, the second instruction gives me the instructions on how much nitrogen to use and what kind of nitrogen to use, okay? The third is a secondary uh, instruction on applying more nitrogen after I've, I've seeded. So, I apply the fertilizer to the soil surface, rake in before seeding, and then three to four weeks later uh, upon germination. This is the role of your soil sample. This tells you what your weaknesses are, uh, whether you need the, the kind of lime you need, and your instructions for putting the lime in and fertilizing. 
Now, this story has a bit of a happy ending because after three years of following this instructions, I raised my pH by a whole point, 5.6 to 6.6. Um, the, the pH scale is logarithmic. That means I have, it, it, it increased every point is, is 10 times what it was the previous. So I'm up near neutral now and my lawn responded much better. That is the role of your soil sample, okay? The reason I say, as you go up down to the bottom of, the, of this slide is the pH scale, okay? I was at 5.6, so I was on this line here, which essentially says that the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, three, essent three very essential elements, and the calcium and magnesium, I could pour these on my lawn and I would not get uh, a proper response. As I moved up the scale to 6.6, .6, you can see the line widens. You see that? And the phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium are more available to my soil. Again, I'm stressing this is the role of your soil sample. This is the information you get and this has how it applies to your lawn and your, and your foundation, your soil. Okay? And we'll move on. Uh, I, I apologize in advance for going through some of this very quickly, but there's a lot of information to cover. Um, the bibliography that, that I passed out with the course um, contains all this information. So hopefully I'll give you a start and you can go and check that bibliography and check those sources and, and learn more. Uh, I want to do a little bit about lawn math. After your soil sample, the next thing that you have to know is how many square feet you have. Okay, if you don't know how many square feet you have, you're probably wasting your money on things like fertilizer, uh, broadleaf weed control. You're probably buying too much or you're probably buying not enough. So the second thing we do after soil sample is figure out how many square feet we have. And that, because everything that you apply to your lawn is so much per thousand square feet, okay? So here are some basic uh, geometric formulas. You may have remembered them from school. You know, you said in school when you were there that, oh, I'll never use this again. But pi r squared, area of a circle, okay? So figure these out. Um, what you do in your lawn is take a look at your area, divide it into sub areas or zones and use a geometric progression. Uh, this is one I did uh, back in 2011 from my house. Uh, I have managed to shrink <laughs> uh, these areas of lawn by adding um, several more flower beds and a little area for a meadow. So I've gotten uh, uh, my square footage down from 19,000 square feet down to about 15,000 square feet, which is a really good number because that is the number that you can find a bag of fertile, one bag of fertilizer or one bag of pre-emergence for, for uh, uh, 15,000 square feet, or you buy a bag of 10,000 and 5,000. So that is divide up your lawn, divide up your area into sections, and then use the geometric formulas to figure out how much square footage you have, okay? Now going into that, uh, this is another basic. Um, the N, P, and K, I'm sure many of you know this already, and, and I'll go through this very quickly. The N, P, and K numbers nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium on the bag of fertilizer. And it, it's also, these numbers also appear on some bags of uh, pre-emergent and, and broadleaf weed control because there is, there are elements uh, 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 of uh, these there are parts of these elements in those bags of fertilizer. Um, the numbers, for instance, in this bag, 21,320, mean that this bag contains, it's a 50 pound bag and contains 21% nitrogen. So that means in this bag, there are 10.5 pounds of nitrogen. Okay, so if you were to put one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet on your lawn per uh, a soil sample recommendation, then this bag would cover how much? 10,500 square feet. 
that would, if you apply this to 10,500 square feet, you would be putting down one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, okay? The same with the P and K, three pound, 3% 3 P um, on a 50 pound bag means it's only 1.5 pounds uh, and K uh, at 20 uh, is 10 pounds, as you can see from this bag. Um, we try to keep um, most uh, places in Delaware have a, a lot of phosphorus in the soil. So we, uh, and we wanna try to keep phosphorus out of our streams, out of our ponds, uh, out of the rivers. So you will see many fertilizers with zero as this number, okay? And we, we, we recommend that given the soil sample, uh, most soil samples will have a preponderance of P, will have excess P, uh, that you try to use a fertilizer that has zero for this number, okay? Uh, a starter fertilizer uh, will have lots of P because uh, you want to establish root and, and phosphorus it, it helps root establish. Esta <laughs> roots establish, excuse me. That takes us into the first uh, selection, uh, the first um, uh, topic uh, for uh, a lawn, and that's seed selection. Uh, as you can see from the map up here at the top, we are graced or cursed, depending on how you look at it, uh, to be in a transition zone. Okay, that means that warm season grasses and cool season grasses will flourish here. Anyone with a Bermuda grass lawn or a Zoysia grass lawn knows that's, that's the case. By the same token, uh, uh, we can also plant uh, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and, and most importantly of all, fescue. Okay, cool season grasses, let's look at those. Uh, these are grasses that will, uh, the optimum growth is between 60 and 75 degrees. The weather we have had lately is not conducive, so the lawns in Delaware right now are pretty much in a dormant period. They don't grow all that much when the temperature is above 75 degrees. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Kentucky bluegrass is a nice green color. It recuperates well. Uh, the minuses are that it damages easily. It suffers from heat. Um, you can't run all over it. Uh, it tends to thatch a little bit and, and it's not very good in drought conditions, which we usually have in, in Delaware uh, in, in the July, August. Um, you will need, if you want to grow a bluegrass lawn, you, you will probably need um, uh, some sort of watering system. Uh, perennial ryegrass establishes very quickly. Uh, this is the builders, uh, the, uh, 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 builders use perennial ryegrass and annual ryegrass in a mixture that is called a builder's mix. It comes up very quickly, uh, but doesn't last. <laughs> So you may move into your house and the lawn looks good, but probably after a year, it, it will begin to thin. Um, it does not wear or recuperate well. You can't run all over it. Um, it does not like heat at all. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, and it, it does not like drought. Uh, and and it, uh, uh, again, you, if you want a, a perennial ryegrass lawn, uh, you, you probably need a, a watering system. Um, here is a comparison chart of uh, all the cool season grasses. Um, this may be a little fuzzy to you. I've been trying to find a better graphic here, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't been successful. Uh, but if you can read this, the top compares fine fescue, bent grass, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, dwarf fescue, and tall fescue, okay? The fine fescues are good for shade, okay? Uh, oops. Uh, this topsy chart is for texture. As you see, for texture, uh, fine fescues, um, they're uh, thin bladed, uh, lighter in color, um, uh, but make a, a very nice texture. The, the tall fescue you can see is, is a more coarse, uh, thicker bladed grass. Uh, if we go to drought resistance, um, the fescues are the 
The fine fescues are good. The tall fescues are very good. All the fescues are good under drought conditions. They're fairly drought resistant. They come back quickly uh, when, when uh, you begin watering or, the, or um, uh, uh, you get uh, a cooler temperature and, and more moisture in the air. Uh, heat tolerance, you'll see uh, the tall fescue and dwarf fescues are uh, much better than the others. Um, cold tolerance, it's about the same. Uh, bent grass and, and Kentucky bluegrass um, uh, tolerate cold a little bit better. Um, but um, we really don't have that problem in Delaware of cold, <laughs> of having to be cold tolerant. Um, wear tolerance, uh, tall fescue again, dwarf fescues again uh, are better than uh, or have more wear tolerance than, than others. Uh, the fine fescue, um, these are, are grass seeds that are good for shade. Uh, if you have a shady area, they're good. Uh, the, the con on them is that they're, they're hard to mow, okay? So when we look at all this together, it would seem that the fescue, tall fescues, have a certain advantage for our conditions here in Delaware. Um, they're wear resistant, tolerant of drought, heat, and salt. Uh, moderately to shade tolerant. Uh, I have uh, uh, fescue growing under, under trees here. Uh, has few disease problems, although you know, uh, in our conditions in midsummer in Delaware, every type of grass has, has uh, disease problems. Uh, it requires less maintenance because it's a slow grower. Um, the fescue is a, a clump type grass, which usually it means it has to be mixed uh, with something else. Um, it also is a little sensitive to some chemicals. Um, uh, you have to be very careful, uh, especially if you treat, uh, if you're treating sedge, if you use too much of that, the, the chemical used to treat sedge, you, you will um, uh, affect the tall fescue. Uh, as I said before, the fine leaf fescues are good for shade. Uh, they withstand higher pHs, uh, but they are difficult to mow. So, um, Kind of summing that up, we'll look at, at the, the mixtures in a few minutes, but um, let's turn our attention for a few seconds onto the warm season grasses. Um, you'll notice that the optimum growth for, for, for the warm season grasses are 80 to 90 degrees. The, these uh, really do need warm uh, and um, uh, humid conditions and they thrive. Uh, zoysia grass, uh, it's probably the only warm season grass grown here on purpose. <laughs> uh, many of you probably have uh, uh, wire grass, the Bermuda grass cultivar. Um, uh, that is similar uh, to the zoysia. Um, it's very aggressive. It's difficult to damage. Uh, planting it can be, a pro can be labor intensive because you plant it with plugs. It requires low maintenance. That means it doesn't grow very quickly, uh, but it will turn brown in the fall and winter. Just like the Bermuda grass, it will turn brown in the fall and the winter. If you don't mind that, uh, uh, maybe a zoysia lawn is, is, is up your alley. Um, we recommend that, that uh, you use a blend of turf grasses. Um, the um, uh, what kind of lawn you want sort of determines what kind of seed you should use. If you like to do other things than mow your grass, then um, for a low to moderate maintenance lawn with full sun, some shade, use primarily turf type tall fescue at six to eight pounds per thousand square feet. We're back to a thousand square feet. Uh, if you like to mow your lawn, you like to spend time, and you have irrigation, um, then Kentucky bluegrass with a little perennial rye uh, for quick germination uh, may be up your alley. That's three to four pounds per thousand square feet. Um, and that, that's for um, new lawn seeding. Uh, for a modern maintenance lawn, um, you might try a blend of fescues, uh, some bluegrass or perennial rye. Uh, that's four to four uh, pounds per thousand square feet is typical. Uh, I've listed below a typical uh, mixture for the state of Delaware. 
you'll notice that it does contain tall fescue predominantly, um, another fescue cultivar, and some Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass. Um, these help to uh, uh, fill in the uh, uh, mitigate the clumping that that is um, um, a uh, characteristic of tall fescue. Now this mixture down here, the K31, uh, is also known as a pasture grass. It's relatively inexpensive, uh, but it's very coarse. It, it wears really well. Um, if you want a showcase lawn, I would not recommend using the K31. You have to go to uh, uh, a more um, uh, a more finer leaf fescue. Um, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of mixtures of grass seed. Um, I have uh, tried many different types. I've, I've planted tall fescue, the K31. Uh, I've ordered uh, grass seed online. Uh, I've um, uh, gone to uh, uh, Clark Seed up in Dover and, and had a special mix made. Um, I've settled upon using for myself, and this is personal, uh, no recommendation using the statesman grass seed from um, southern states. Uh, it's moderately priced. You can spend for a 40, 50 pound bag of, of grass seed, you can spend over $100 uh, getting top quality seed. Uh, that depends on your budget, how much you want to spend um, on your lawn. Uh, but you can buy seed again online. Uh, um, uh, southern states, there are several seed, uh, like Clark seed, that will sell you um, uh, whatever kind of mixture you want to put on your lawn. Uh, I was up at the University of Delaware. Uh, they have a testing area up there that is probably 50 yards by 100 yards divided into uh, one square yard squares. And each one of those squares has a different type of grass seed in it. So uh, I cannot possibly cover all the different types of seed, um, but uh, I can tell you that typical for Delaware, uh, um, you can find a, at most uh, lawn and garden centers, you can find a mix for Delaware. And that will usually contain something along the lines of these percentages, 60 to 70% tall fescue, uh, another cultivar of fescue and a mixture of, of bluegrass or and or perennial rye. Okay, um, moving on, uh, let's take a look at the planting procedures uh, for seeding. You notice it says here at the top of my list here, seed from, from August the 15th to September 30th. Um, this is a bit mitigated by the fact that we seem to have milder uh, falls and, and winter. We had almost no, no snow at all last winter. Uh, it was, uh, the temperatures were, were uh, relatively mild, uh, uh, at least through Christmas, if my memory serves correctly. Um, therefore, there's some flexibility here, especially if you are trying to solve weed problems. Uh, because you have to halt your weed uh, activity, de-weeding uh, activity, uh, enough time to give your soil uh, and this uh, give your soil time to to uh, uh, become uh, pliable for um, seeding. You can't use a pre-emergent, or you can't use some weed and feeds um, before you start seeding. There are some chemicals that you can use, um, but uh, uh, we'll not, I'll not get into that right now. Uh, so you have to, to, to have a, 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 an interim period before when, you're, when you stop killing weeds and you start growing grass. There has to be an interim period of time there. Um, if you notice my list on the right, the optimum temperature for seed germination. So, uh, if we go down here to, to, we'll take a look at two, the Kentucky bluegrass and uh, the tall fescue. So we're looking at temperatures uh, below 86 degrees. When will the temperature on a, on, a, on a daily basis 
average below 86 degrees. At this point would be the time we can start um, a seeding or overseeding, uh, at least for the perennial rye, uh, the tall fescue, and Kentucky bluegrass. Also, looking at the low end, we don't want to go too late into the, the fall uh, or early winter because we need at least 68 degrees uh, for the fescues and 59 degrees for Kentucky bluegrass. Um, secondly, uh, so the timing of, of seeding, the timing of the seeding process depends on, on your weed control regimen and uh, the beginning of uh, um, the temperature becoming suitable for seeding. In that interim period, what we're going to be doing, and we'll talk about this a little bit better, is preparing the soil. Okay. Um, the, the next most important thing is to spread that seed evenly. Uh, just tossing it around really doesn't do it. What we're looking at for, uh, usually for overseeding, is uh, 15 to 20 seeds per square inch. If you put it a little bit in your hand, um, look at a square inch and count 15 to 20 seeds. This is probably uh, uh, the easiest way I've found to, to make sure that you're getting the seed, uh, enough seed down. Uh, and, it, and you should use some sort of spreader, rotary uh, spreader, uh, to make sure that the seed's going down evenly, okay? We want to uh, cover uh, the seed lightly. We don't want to, uh, we'll talk about this when we, uh, we do, when I talk about top dressing, we don't want to put the seed down and cover it with soil. Okay, the rule of thumb that we all, we all know is that you, you don't want to plant a seed more than twice the width of the seed. Well, little grass seed's very small, so it really just needs to be in contact with the soil. We don't want to cover it. We don't want to bury it too deep. Um, if you're uh, uh, planting your seed and it's a little bit warmer, you might want to mulch with salt and hay to protect the seed. Uh, the other thing is you want to keep that seed moist through the germination period. So make sure you have some means of, uh, of watering, of irrigation, in order to keep that seed wet. Uh, the sod process is a little easier if you're going to sod your lawn. There are a number of, of sod farms around here. Uh, Maryland's famous for its sod farms. I believe there's one down near Salisbury. Um, uh, if you want to sod problem areas, uh, you can sod almost any time, but you have to prepare the soil, uh, moisten the soil, uh, lay the sod. Uh, there are any number of instructional videos you can find for laying the sod. You want to tamp it and then you want to sprinkle topsoil on the cracks. Topsoil mixed with sand maybe, or builder's sand, coarser sand. Okay, that, 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 that covers a bit of planting procedures. Um, to establish a new lawn, um, this is something that if you have, uh, your lawn is cursed with more than 50% weeds or, or you really want to get rid of that wire grass, uh, establish your new lawn procedures should begin um, with the site preparation, which would be if you want to get rid of the fescue, or the, not the fescue, excuse me, the, the um, uh, wire grass in your lawn or, or, or weeds, you, you want to turn that lawn over uh, probably starting in mid-July. Um, then your turf grass selection based on the kind of lawn that you want and the characteristics of the seed. Uh, we'll look at planting procedures and then, then post-planting care for establishing a new lawn, which are pretty much the same as, as overseeding. Um, you want to remove or kill existing debris. This includes uh, the weeds. So you will you probably use a non-specific a non herbicide like glyphosate or, or there are some others. Uh, you remember glyphosate doesn't stay in the soil uh, all that long. So you, it's probably the best if you want to get the process moving. I would recommend a soil test. Uh, you want to see how conducive that soil is to growing uh, grass. Uh, that would mean that after your soil test, you modify the soil pH. I put sulfur here, which is usually used out west to decrease uh, your pH. Uh, I, I, I don't know anyone in Delaware. I have not met anyone in Delaware that needed to decrease their pH. So 
uh, lime, um, limestone, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, um, dolomitic lime contains more magnesium and calcium. Usually what's used in Delaware uh, for ease is pelletized lime, which does contain, uh, it's like a calcite lime, but it, it, it's pellets, uh, which is easy to spread. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, dust up, um, uh, uh, it, it breaks down quickly in the soil. So uh, I would recommend using pelletized lime uh, if, you, if you need liming. Um, organic matter, if you, you wanna till that in, um, two to four inches per square foot. We'll talk a little bit more about tilling in when I uh, go over top dressing. Establish a smooth surface, rake in your starter fertilizer, okay? Um, and then seed. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about renovating an existing lawn. Again, the process is, is kind of the same, site preparation, turf grass selection, planting procedures, and post-planting care. Um, correct the problem areas, bare spots, weeds. Um, probably the biggest problem is, is where the dog went. <laughs> um, in some cases, there's a bare spot there. You may have to, to dig out that soil down to maybe an inch, half inch, and, and replace that soil, uh, especially if, if they went repeatedly in the same places as our little, our little friends have a tendency to do. Uh, weeds, uh, uh, using integrated pest management, the best way is to identify the weed and use a specific um, uh, herbicide to correct that weed. Um, I live on a pond. I, I don't like to, to uh, put down herbicide all over, so I spend my time spot spraying weeds. Uh, I, I don't want to put that much herbicide into my pond or on my, my land. Dethatch if necessary. Um, I have some graphs coming up that will show you where the, the dethatch is. Some people mistake uh, clippings for thatch. The, the clippings that you, you put on your lawn are, are not the thatch. The thatch is, is, is a layer below that. Uh, if you can scratch the ground uh, with your finger and see soil, you do not have a thatch a problem with thatch. Uh, aerate if necessary. Um, this is this I would recommend is core aeration. Um, usually, people have to bring in a machine uh, or, or have someone else or a lawn service come in and aerate. This is especially necessary if you have clay soils. You need to break this up. Uh, uh, aerating is also a part of. Um, uh, top dressing, if you, if you want to get more organic soil, uh, organic material under your soil, you can aerate and then top dress. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Again, a soil sample, modify the pH, dress uh, or top dress with soil or topsoil or compost, and fertilize per your test results. So all this takes some preparation, okay? So these are planting procedures for renovating uh, a lawn. Uh, the laying the turf, uh, if you go online, uh, I think also in my uh, bibliography, uh, this, this URI is in there um, on how to, to lay the turf, um, roll it, um, uh, and uh, cut it, and then sprinkle the top with topsoil or top mixture of topsoil and sand. Um, here are some tools for lawn renovation in case you... you uh, are gone at it. Um, a core aerator is very important. A roller, especially for sod. Uh, a roller, after you've seeded, make sure that the seed is in contact with the soil, which is very, very important. Um, a slit seeder and spike seeders, uh, literally just cut a small slice into the ground, uh, not very deep, uh, and, and you can top dress over that or seed over that. Uh, hand seeder. Um, this is uh, a, um, a tool to make sure that that seed gets down uniformly. Okay, a dethatching rake. Uh, you want to you'll want to use a tool. <laughs> you'll want to use a if you have to dethatch. You'll want to use uh, and you have a large area. Uh, you you want to use a machine. 
Um, a lawn stitcher is good for smaller uh, areas. Um, this is also uh, a hand cult also called a hand cultivator. You can find them in various sizes, but essentially they'll uh, put holes in the soil and break up that top layer of soil so you can get the seed uh, into the ground. A rotary seeder is what most people use. Um, you know, You'll want to calibrate that and make sure you know how much seed you're putting down uh, per thousand square feet. Um, we can calibrate that by taking one pound of seed or two pounds of seed um, and uh, lay out an area uh, 10 feet by uh, 100 feet by 10 feet or 20 by uh, 50 and putting that seed down um, if you have more or less, then you'll have to adjust your calibration on, on your seeder, okay? But the point is to get uh, seed down in, in a uniform manner. Uh, that takes us to top dressing and patching. Uh, this is what, we, what I mostly end up doing uh, in the fall. Right now, I'll, I'll probably start next week uh, looking at all my bare spots, all my thin spots, uh, to go in and, and get the soil prepared to, to, to take the seed. Um, what we're talking about is a uniform application, a thin layer of organic material over the turf, over the turf surface. This is a, a fall is, is a perfect time to, to top dress your lawn. You can do it in the spring, but, but uh, uh, top dressing and patching is, uh, in the fall is a really good, the fall is a really good time. Um, Top dress, you can control the thatch, level and smooth the turf surface. Um, it can protect the grass against low temperatures um, and it adds organic matter to the, to the root zone. Um, the best top dressing materials um, are those that match the, the soil on site. If you use a different mixture, then it can cause layering. You will have a layer of maybe sand and clay, but then a layer of organic matter um, it can cause it can cause moisture problems. Okay, um, materials that are used in top dressing are compost, uh, sand, and when I say sand, I'm talking about builder sand, something more coarse than 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 playground sand or or, or bunker sand, golf course sand. Uh, this is a coarser sand. It, it holds water a little bit better. Peat moss and topsoil, uh, aged compost is very good. Uh, compost mixed with topsoil is usually the best. What we're talking about is putting down one eighth to one quarter inch of material. Um, that, uh, if you take that out mathematically, that's that's a half to eight tenths of a cubic yard per thousand square feet. Not a lot. Uh, laying it can be a little labor intensive. Um, if your lawn has uh, more than a half inch of thatch, you can't see, you can scratch the surface and not see soil, then you will have to dethatch um, or corrate your lawn first. R uh, remove the debris from dethatching. Core aeration, um, if your soil is pretty good, you can leave the cores on the, um, uh, the ground. They will uh, disintegrate, disintegrate or, or blend back into the lawn naturally. Uh, mow the lawn as, as short as possible without stressing the grass. Now this depends on the temperature. Um, the higher the temperature, the higher you want your lawn um, to, to give it um, strength to deal with the stress. Uh, but if you're doing this in the fall, when the temperatures are, are, are below 85 degrees, then you can cut back uh, um, uh, to two inches, two and a half inches. Um, remove the clippings uh, and any dethatching degree. If you have poor soil, i.e. heavy clay, then I would recommend uh, core aerating. Spread your top dressing over the lawn, as I said, a quarter to a half inch. Um, you can use the back of a rake, uh, likely uh, uh, rub it into the soil. Get as much top dressing touching the soil as possible. When you're overseeding, do this after you top dress. Uh, we don't want to bury the seed. Um, keep the soil moist, not too wet, um, uh, uh, but you, you have to do this um, uh, until you get air, uh, germination. Uh, now we'll look at, at uh, some post-planting care. Um, uh, 
when you seed or sod, you'll want to keep that, that new uh, grass, uh, the new seed moist. I've said that several times. I can't stress it enough. Um, don't mow until the newly seeded uh, turf or sod reach two and a half to three inches. Give it a chance to grow. I would even uh, cheat a little bit more and, and wait until it's three and a half to four inches. Um, as my soil sample uh, instructed me, uh, fertilize with one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet uh, three to four weeks after planting. Um, avoid heavy mowing equipment uh, because you don't want to rut. This is particularly uh, true on sod. Um, you will see uh, 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 rutting if you run that tractor over, over wet sod or, or very moist um, grass. <clears throat> we don't want to do that. Compaction is a, always a problem. All right, let's turn our attention to maintaining a healthy lawn. Um, I think uh, I'm going quickly because I'm probably running out of the hour. Um, we'll look at mowing, soil management. Again, we'll look at a little bit of fertil about fertilization, watering, and then we'll talk about pest, pest um, control. Uh, weeds, insects, and, and, and diseases that are specific here in Delaware. Um, again, I've laid this out. This graphic shows the lawn year, um, where we get in April and May, um, the growth is in the blades of grass itself, okay? All, anything you put on your lawn fertilizer will go from the roots into the lawn itself through the growth. Then we reach a period of summer stress, which we're probably in right now. Um, you don't have to mow your grass more than probably once a week, if that. Um, letting it, the, the, the lawn uh, get up to, to three and a half, four inches is probably best. It helps it deal with the summer stress. And then when we get into fall, the, the, the operation is reversed. The, the grass anything you put on your soil will be moved into the roots because the roots are preparing in themselves for the dormant period of winter, okay? So that essentially is how the grass goes from spring through fall. You'll get your major leaf growth uh, in the spring. You'll get uh, more root growth in the fall. And this is what we want. We want really good roots. We want really strong roots. Um, mowing height. Let's look at mowing heights. I um, am amazed at the number of people uh, in our area in Delaware who scalp their grass, who take it down to an inch, uh, to less than two inches. Um, the roots are stressed. When it gets hot, a, 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 a lawn that short will die. The roots will not be able to sustain its growth. So I look at the mowing heights. And this is the average mowing heights, okay? A tall fescue lawn, we're looking at two and a half to three inches. I usually keep mine three and a, three and a half to four inches. Um, uh, in, in the summer in Delaware, fescue lawns may have a tendency to turn brown, but they come back. They, they do come back, uh, but not if you scalp it. <laughs> uh, in the spring and fall, you can cut shorter, um, uh, follow the rule of one third. Never take more than one third off the top, especially uh, if you're leaving the clippings. If say you go on vacation, well, who goes on vacation anymore? <laughs> um, say you, you haven't been able to mow your grass for a while, it gets high. Uh, probably you're going to take off more than one third. I would pick up those clippings, okay, because they don't have time to disintegrate naturally to rot naturally in the grass surface. That's why we only take off one third. That gives the, 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 the top, the one third of the lawn time to get in and provide the nitrogen that, that your lawn needs uh, because that, that, contain, that, top, that top grass contains nitrogen. So we try to leave uh, the clippings on the lawn, uh, but not more than one third of the cut at a time. If you'll notice, uh, and I, I think it's coming up, the, the instructions that you get with your soil sample for lawns will give you amounts of nitrogen with clippings and without clippings, okay? Uh, in order to make sure that you're mulching that top one third, you need to keep your mower blade sharp, okay? Um, 
Also, when mowing, use alternate patterns. Don't mow your grass the same way the same time. Some areas it may be difficult not to, sides of hills or around flower beds, but if you offset where you mow, you, know, you start a you know, half a mower width away uh, and then come back and do the inner, you won't mow the same time. Um, there's a lawn in my neighborhood, the guy mows exactly the same way every time to the point where it's rutted. <laughs> mow a different pattern uh, each time. Have two or three different patterns that you mow your lawn. Um, it will look nice. I think it would look, it looks nicer uh, in the patterns. Like a baseball field, they, they mow in patterns, but never the same pattern twice uh, or two times in a row. Um, let's just take a look quickly at, and I put this in almost every presentation on, on lawn care, uh, on um, uh, flower care. Um, there are three steps for a healthy soil. One is to adjust the pH. Make sure your pH is as neutral as possible. Um, there are some cases, if you're growing blueberries, Debbie, um, where you um, may want a lower pH, but as far as lawn goes, we want as neutral as possible. Um, again, this is uh, 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 liming for, to adjust that pH, and this will take time. Uh, as I said, it took three years for me liming every year to get my pH from 5.6 to 6.6. It does not happen overnight. Uh, even if you're trying to reduce the pH, it will not happen overnight. It takes time. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> uh. Uh, the texture of the soil, organic matter, and the plants to be grown are all factors in, in adjusting your pH. Um, that's why uh, when you look at the chemistry from your soil sample, it will tell you. You can't figure all this stuff out, but your soil sample uh, and the people at the, at the lab will be able to do that. Um, I noticed, I noticed, I think that I, I meant to say this at the beginning when talking about soil samples, but I noticed that the price went up. Uh, you can check the Master Gardener website or the U University of Delaware website for information on how to acquire a package, uh, a, a soil sample package, and then paying for it and where to send it. That's all online. It all went up online uh, again recently. Um, the second step is to add organic matter. Usually in, when it comes to lawns, that's, that's by top dressing. Uh, mix the top dressing first and then put it on your lawn and then seed. Uh, <clears throat> um, I take uh, any clippings that I have and, and I mix those with, with um, leaves and some other material to make my compost. So I always have a nice a pile of compost and back that I, I usually mix with uh, lawn soil uh, to do my top dressing. Um, adjust nutrients, fertilize and adjust your nutrients. Um, this, this is just general information on this slide about uh, um, fertilizing and adding, adding other nutrients to, to your soil. Um, generally speaking, we're looking at a 412 ratio of N, P, and K. Uh, in Delaware, the one uh, for phosphorus, we're trying not to use much phosphorus. I believe even in Maryland, it, it, it's almost impossible to buy a, a fertilizer with uh, phosphorus in it. Uh, usually what we want is, is um, uh, the WIN or slow release nitrogen over a period of time. If you'll notice on the right, the, <laughs> the soluble N or WIN, uh, which uh, uh, breaks down over a period of time, provides the, the fertilizer in slow dose. Um, you'll notice the two clippings removed, instructions, when to fertilize and how much. Um, <clears throat> with clippings left on, left on it's uh, considerably less uh, uh, fertilizer um, required. <clears throat> um, Again, here's a graphic that essentially lays the lawn year into uh, when to fertilize. Um, uh, you'll notice that no one fertilizes or should fertilize in July. 
It's a waste of money to fertilize in July. Wait till the temperatures get cooler. My neighbor just fertilized in July. I, I, I'm, I was astounded. I couldn't believe the truck was out there. I'm going, you know, I, I wanted to run up to the guy and, and shake him and going, what? Are, but I could, you can't do that. Uh, anyway, uh, early fall, we're looking at early fall. This is dinner. Uh, we want to fortify our roots for, for a long, cold winter, if we have one. Uh, early spring, um, we fertilize to, to, to get our lawn jump started. Uh, late spring, a snack. And, and um, late summer, uh, uh, after the stress period, whenever late summer comes, uh, we give it a little, uh, another little snack. Um, here's some information on dethatching and aerating. Um, I'm going to go over this quickly. Um, most people, if you have a, a reasonable size lawn, would probably hire someone to do this. Uh, you, need you need machinery over a large period of time. You can do it um, uh, uh, on a small uh, uh, area, um, but the rule of thumb here is if you have um, less than half an inch, you can scratch the surface with your finger and, and find soil. Uh, you don't need to, you're, you're good. Um, insulating against weed seeds is pretty good. The last time I dethatched and aerated, uh, I had the worst weed year possible. I must have pumped up out of the soil as many weeds as has been <laughs> that had been there for 20 years. Uh, so that, that sometimes is a, is a byproduct of, of uh, dethatching and aerating. Um, <laughs> Uh, here's a graphic showing. Um, I actually uh, bought my wife a pair of these for Christmas. Um, I had to hide the knives for a week. Um, <laughs> that's just a joke, sorry. Uh, again, the graphic shows uh, the process of aerating, um, the uh, development of re weeds, eight to 10 weeks following a good aeration, a good core aeration. Um, let's see, uh, watering, uh, we tend to in Delaware over water lawns. I see people watering their lawn every morning. Um, what we want to do is water deeply, uh, and, and, um, uh, regularly, um, the chart that I've displayed here shows you, uh, we might want to increase the amount we put down. Uh, over the summer dormant period uh, and then decrease in the spring and fall. So what we want to do is water deeply uh, uh, and evenly. Uh, you may have to, if you have sprinklers, you may want to use the old tuna can uh, test. Take a can of tuna, take three cans of tuna and put them out along your sprinkler. One close to the sprinkler, one midway and one out at the end, okay? And time, take a, a, a measurement of the time it takes to fill a tuna can, which is about one inch, okay? And that's what we wanna put down on our lawns weekly. Uh, this year has been very strange. Uh, high humidity lasting well into the day. Um, I would recommend uh, using the humidity to, to as a time when to water because um, when it's humid out, you won't get evaporation. Uh, I think because of the humidity, even the dew stays on the grass into the afternoon. So uh, when you see the high humidity, that's a good time to water. Uh, we're trying to get the water deeply and evenly in order to ensure good root growth. So using uh, you know five or 10 minutes of water every day during the week is not gonna do it. What we need to do is water deeply. Um, I usually water uh, one day in the morning, afternoon, um, uh, one day a week, or maybe two if, it, if it's really hot and dry. Uh, again, the humidity uh, mitigates evaporation. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the sprinkling of water on your lawn uh, will do nothing to, to help your root growth. Uh, we're going to look at pest management now. Um, I'm looking here uh, um, mostly at broadleaves first. Um, the summer annuals, um, 
these are ones that, that we control in the spring, uh, either by uh, putting down a pre-emergent, especially for crabgrass and goosegrass, um, and or, or broadleaf herbicide. Um, this is, a, 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 is kicked off when the forsythia bloom in the spring. Okay, that, that's the spring. But for the fall, what we're looking at, um, these are summer annuals. Uh, I'll go over that. I mean, I'm, I'll kind of skip by that because these are things that we take care of in the spring. Uh, what we're looking at is the winter annuals. These are seeds uh, that germinate in late summer and early September. Uh, you can control these with a pre-emergent applied in early September. Now, remember that if you're having, if you want a seed, then you're going to have to, to find a time. Um, you're going to have to rationalize the time between applying uh, a pre-emergent because it will affect your seeding and, and, and putting down a pre-emergent. But if you're not going to be seeding or you're just going to be overseeding certain areas, um, then you can put down a, a, a pre-emergent to take care of, of this. Probably the annual bluegrass or, or, or probably better known as poana um, uh, will, will begin to, to germinate uh, in early September. Other uh, winter annual weeds are, are chickweed, the henbit, bittercress. Bitter uh, these are all examples, um, and, and dead nettle. Um, these will all, uh, uh, you can uh, mitigate these with uh, a broadleaf um, <clears throat> herbicide uh, put down in, in September. Uh, I have the last couple of years, I've been putting my lawn to bed I've been uh, doing my seeding as early as I possibly can, beginning with, with preparing the soil in August. Uh, when the temperature gets cool, doing my top dressing and seeding in September, two to three weeks later after the, my seed is germinated and I've been able to cut my grass two or three times, um, close down my lawn year by putting down a pre-emergent. Um, I don't have very many weeds. I don't have hardly any, as a matter of fact, but I do have um, wire grass. Um, these are broadleaf perennials. These will come up anytime, uh, particularly nasty, the wild garlic and onion, particularly wild and garlic. It, once you get these, it, it's very, very difficult to, to get rid of them. Uh, in some cases, you will have to use a nonspecific herbicide, uh, glyphosate, or, or others. Uh, this includes, this group includes plantain, dandelions, um, white clover uh, is in this, uh, uh, white clover also being a, a, um, a sign that you, you may need more nitrogen in your soil. Um, there's also a class of weeds um, uh, called sedges. They're, they're not really grasses. Um, I believe in Delaware, uh, the worst is down here in the lower right hand corner, the yellow nut sage. Um, when you, if you try to pull this, you must wait until the ground is, is uh, a bit damp so you can get that little nut out at the end, uh, get all the roots out. Um, this, this weed particularly likes humid, uh, wet conditions. Um, there is a chemical um, that is specific for it. Um, and I'm trying to remember it right now, uh, begins with an S, uh, sulfetrazine. That's it, sulfetrazine uh, is specific to that, but be careful in ap applying it because it, it, fescue is a bit sensitive to it. Um, uh, again, we wanna try for selective herbicides, but some of these, these pests are uh, 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 sort of mitigate against it. Um, particularly things like stiltgrass, uh, nimblewill, We'll talk about Bermuda or wiregrass um, by itself. Um, orchard grass, very thick. Um, there was a picture of goosegrass also falls into this, this, this category. It, it looks like a, a very thick grass with a white center. It's goosegrass. Um, I'm gonna do, I, I mentioned IPM, Integrated Pest Management. Uh, once you've identified the fact that you have a Bermuda grass problem or a Cynodon dactylon uh, problem, that, that is the cultivar uh, um, for uh, what we call wire grass in Delaware, but it's a cultivar of Bermuda grass. 
Um, we'll look at uh, using IPM, integrated pest management, we'll look at it, attacking it or suppressing Bermuda grass uh, using different practices, uh, cultural, biological, uh, and chemical, uh, things that we can do to mitigate uh, uh, this cruelest of, of all uh, Delaware uh, pest, a lawn pest. Um, when you bring stuff into your property, make sure, uh, check it out, make sure that plant material does not contain uh, Bermuda seed or, or roots. Um, uh, it, grow, it will grow from root, as we all know, it will grow from root, it will grow from stolen, and it will grow from seed. Uh, increase your mowing heights. Okay, if you do have a good fescue lawn, what we're trying to do here is shade it. It loves the sun. I had a young uh, a fella tell me that he had Bermuda grass come up at, a, at the bottom of a tree in the shade, and that Bermuda grass grew up the tree seeking the sun. So what we want to try to do is, is at every instance, we want to try to provide shade. Taller fescue canopy uh, uh, can be used to shade it. Um, uh, maintain proper fertility. For fertility, um, uh, if we fertilize in the spring and fall, that's good. You fertilize in the summer, you, you'll be asking for the Bermuda grass to go nuts. Uh, water deeply and infrequently. Um, uh, the Bermuda grass doesn't care about the hotter, the da the hotter, the wetter, the better. Um, the infrequent, uh, uh, shallow and frequent irrigation will, will, will favor the Bermuda grass. It loves the water, it loves the heat. Uh, pay attention to the flower beds. Keep these areas free. Uh, border them. Use heavy mulch. Um, again, shade um, uh, when you can. Uh, I've planted trees just in my property, just where I have um, where I have the wire grass just to shade it. And so I position my trees. Uh, I, I've had this problem for a long time. Uh, physical practices. What can we do physically um, to, to mitigate, suppress this problem? Uh, one of the things is dig and invert. This is labor intensive. Uh, um, you, you, you probably uh, plow it up, uh, dig it up, turn it over and expose the roots. Uh, in order to do this, you have to dig down about a foot. Uh, this past spring, I dug about uh, 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 40 feet of new flower bed. Uh, I went down about a foot. I turned it over. I, <laughs> I turned it over. I sprayed it. Uh, I pulled it out. Um, uh, uh, um, and it, it came, it comes, <laughs> it still comes back. Anyway, uh, the roots will dry out and die if you get it, turn, turn it over. This is, this is effective if you have it coming up in a flower bed. You know, dig down about a foot, take it, turn that soil over and expose the roots. Um, also, uh, other uh, uh, methods that people have tried is, is covering the fest area with, with heavy plastic. Uh, don't use light plastic, use heavy plastic. Uh, and again, you, you have to, to, to keep it from sunlight for probably two months um, and do this during the summer. Um, People have said it kills it. Other people have said that the, the stuff starts growing up around it. Uh, another variation is to use heavy cardboard. Um, another method is solarization, another physical practice. Uh, clear plastic in the summer months to heat it and kill it. Uh, this is particularly good to kill the, the, the seeds. Now, I understand that when you do cover it, you will kill everything. You will solarize, uh, you will kill everything. Um, the last cultural, the last physical practice is almost a cultural practice. Uh, learn to live with it. Uh, if you don't want to get into plastics, poisons, digging strategies, you just learn to live with it. Uh, it's green all summer. And it just turns brown over the winter. Um, but uh, I have sort of come to grips with the areas in my lawn that are uh, wire grass. Uh, I've uh, managed to keep it at bay slightly. Um, using a chemical method, but if you don't want to do that, um, learn to live with it. Um, biological methods. There are biological methods uh, for almost everything these days where you introduce a living organism uh, to control a population of unwanted pets. 
Uh, however, at this time, there's no biological control for wiregrass. I'm sorry. Um, I've read one study of some guy in Ethiopia who's working on some nematode, uh, but that's Ethiopia. Uh, chemical methods. Um, there are a couple chemicals, there's four actually. Two can be used in, in fescue lawns, uh, fescue or Bermuda grass lawns. The two are written here, phenoxaprop and fluozofop. Um, I want to point out first the cautions. Uh, these herbicides are expensive. Um, you'll find a bare product in the big box stores that, that say uh, Bermuda grass kills Bermuda grass. Uh, read the label, you will find out that, that the bottle itself is, is, is um, 10, 12 dollars, something like that. Um, you have to, if you read the label, you have to use it uh, every month for five or six months um, uh, and over two years. <laughs> um, it, it's expensive. Uh, and it requires multiple applications. So please, if you see something, a chemical or something in, in the store uh, for Bermuda grass, read the label carefully. It, it, uh, the, all the ones that I've seen um, uh, 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 take multiple sprains uh, over a period of time and do require a, a surficant or a juvigant, which is a chemical that is used to, to keep the um, a chemical on the uh, target. Um, these uh, two chemicals, um, and I, I put some trade names there, um, I've used them, I, I'm in uh, the second year, uh, and I've suppressed uh, some of my, my uh, Bermuda grass, uh, but I certainly haven't killed it. Um, uh, again, uh, especially the phenoxaprop and the philosophop are expensive. Uh, we're talking uh, you know, $40, $50. The tricloper is a little bit less expensive. Um, I use that as a tank, as a tank mix uh, uh, because it gets rid of the rest of the weeds and I can spot spray one time using the tank mix and get rid of most of my uh, 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 weeds. Um, uh, let's see, I think I've covered the most important thing is the cautions. Um, let's quickly go to insect control, um, the white grubs that we uh, uh, can mitigate with uh, either a milky spore, which uh, please make sure you, uh, before you, you begin a milky spore application, you understand the amount of time and the number of applications required in milky spore. Uh, there are some other um, uh, insecticides, uh, commercial insecticides, uh, that you would put down probably starting in, in June, July. Um, well, and again, you could probably uh, do a second application in, in uh, about this time and into the fall uh, uh, for grubs. Uh, cinch bugs uh, are another. Um, you know, detect to see whether you have cinch bugs. It's the old trick of putting a, a, a large coffee can into the ground, uh, putting a, a couple inches or four inches of water in there. Uh, the bugs will float to the surface. Uh, if you don't have them, uh, thank, thank, thank goodness, because <clears throat> uh, they will uh, uh, attack roots. Uh, sod webworms, we see these out in the morning. You, you'll see the little uh, webs. Um, you'll see them flying above. They haven't been a problem this year uh, so far. I think that, that, that um, uh, neither have the cinch bugs. Uh, and, and the grubs haven't been too much of a problem, blowing to the fact that we've had a, a, a bit of a wet summer. Um, again, you can use the coffee can to see if you have them and then treat them with a labeled insecticide. Uh, disease control. There are certain things that we can do uh, naturally to, to, to keep, uh, to prevent uh, conditions, with, conditions which facilitate these disease control, which essentially in Delaware are, are, are a couple of funguses. Uh, fungi, excuse me. Compaction, don't park your car on your lawn. Uh, make sure that, that uh, uh, you balance the fertility in your soil. Don't over fertilize, don't under fertilize. Scalping, again, using or, 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 or using a dull blade. Uh, give your roots a chance. Poor drainage, if you have areas where water sits, uh, it will cause a problem. 
uh, and low pH. This we can mitigate through, again, a soil sample. Uh, in Delaware, there are two, uh, I mean, there are more than two, and there's a URL on this um, slide, and uh, I believe it's, it's in my bibliography as well. These are two uh, lawn diseases <clears throat> that look like a, a white powdery mold on your lawn. Uh, the dollar spot comes in smaller spots. A uh, brown patch can be in a little bit longer. Um, they're present in lawn, in most lawns, uh, but um, when the nighttime temperatures get up above 65 degrees, uh, and we've been averaging over 70 degrees at night, uh, they will become active, especially, again, as we've had the weather temperatures 80, 85 degrees during the day and high humidities. Um, again, it seems familiar, heavy rains followed by intense heat. That's, that, that is the story of our summer so far. So this has been a problem. Uh, there are fungicides that you can use. Um, again, uh, one other thing that you can do is make sure you don't put your lawn to bed wet. Don't water too late in the day. Um, and um, <clears throat> water infrequently, deeply and infrequently. Uh, keep the moisture off your soil. I know I have too much moisture in my soil right now because I have mushrooms coming up. Uh, I should probably build a house back there. Um, to reduce this, you want to core aerate um, to reduce the thatch and compaction. Uh, again, there are a number of fungicides in the URL that was listed on the last so slide. Um, there is a list of fungicides that, that can be used. Um, what I want to talk about for a few seconds, I know I've gone over time, but uh, this is a subject that, that is near and dear to my heart since I live on a pond. Uh, I. Uh, uh, want to make sure people understand the, the effect. Uh, we've almost killed many ponds and streams uh, by not limiting runoff. What you put down on your lawn or property is going to end up in all likelihood in a stream or a river. Um, use no phosphorus fertilizers. Follow your soil, tample, your soil sample recommendation uh, for the amounts of fertilizer to use. Keep your graft kippings in the lawn. I am, uh, I get a little upset when I see people mow their grass and throw the grass out into the middle of the street. This will wash down your storm drains and end up in that, all that nitrogen that was in your lawn clippings will end up in a pond, a river, or a stream. The same guy that does that is the guy that's complaining that there's no fish in the pond. Well, this stuff kills the fish. <laughs> um, Again, you want to sweep up fertilizer spills, keep them off the driveways, sidewalks, keep leaves uh, out of the street. Uh, leaves are a great mulch. If you want to pile your leaves up and then run your lawnmower over them, they break down so quickly that they, they provide a, a really good mulch. Um, if you do live on a pond or a stream or a river, uh, leave something along the river, along the to, to try to mitigate the the runoff, leave plants along the shoreline. Um, lastly, uh, all of us responsible pet owners pick up your pet waste. Uh, in Delaware, not only does this, uh, can this affect rivers and shoreline, many of us have um, shallow wells, wells around 75 to 90 feet. Uh, we do not want dog crap in our water. So please dispose of pet waste and, and, and litter properly. Um, the, what we're trying to suppress or mitigate is, is something called eutrophication, uh, where we uh, literally, through not um, trying to, to, to uh, control what we put into our rivers and streams, we tend to, to um, take the oxygen. What, what happens is we take the oxygen out of the rivers and streams. Uh, we, we kill the fish and other organisms that live in the stream. So I add this to the bottom of every lawn presentation because we in Delaware, many of us live on the mill ponds uh, or we live close to the ocean uh, or other bodies of water, even if, the, even if they're uh, ponds that we use uh, for um, uh, uh, erosion control. Many communities have these ponds um, please be aware eutrophication is a problem. We almost killed Lake Erie back in the, in the, 80, in the 1980s. Um, we don't want that to happen. 
Uh, I throw some disclaimers. I know I went through everything fast and I went over time. I apologize for that. Um, but uh, uh, I wanted to, to try to get some questions in. Um, Debbie, can I turn it over to you for questions? Okay, we do have a whole slew of questions for you, Steve. Oh crap! So I'm going to try to I'm going to try to kind of group them. Um, the first ones were about soil testing. Um, so uh, somebody asked about um, where or how they can get their soil sample done, and then a related question was someone asked if there was time to request request the soil test and still seed the season. Uh, the soil test, uh, as I said, if you go to the Master Gardener website uh, or the University of Delaware, udel.edu, uh, you should be able to navigate to where, uh, to the soil lab for soil testing information. Uh, I know you can order those by mail uh, and you can return to my mail. They have a post office box. They are up and working. Uh, it does not take long. I, I, I think they could probably, we're looking at a couple weeks maybe. So if you got your soil sample in, get the kit. In the kit, there's a pamphlet that shows you how to do your soil sample. You just don't take one. Uh, for lawns, we go down four inches, L-A-W-N. We go down four inches uh, and take a coring from that four inches. We do that in multiple spots. But again, um, I probably should have included um, that latest information in this. I, I apologize for that, but it's a readily available on the University of Delaware website. Uh, and I think on Master Gardener websites, it's all, that information is also available. I hope that helps. Does that answer the question? Um, I think, and Megan has been putting the links in the chat box too, also for people to go to the website. Great, thank you, Megan, thank yeah. you. And um, the next question um, is related. Someone is having a problem with uh, Japanese silk grass um, growing oh, under the trees, and they wanna know, um, what the pH should be lowered to, to deter that? Um, that depends on what their pH is, but I, I wouldn't lower my pH if it's around neutral, six to seven, 6.5, 7.5. Uh, stilt grass um, uh, is a problem. I know it's a problem in Maryland. Um, there's a chemical that you can use on it um, uh, called tenacity. T-E-N-A-C-I-T-Y, that's a brand name, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the chemical is mesotrione, M-E-S-T-R-I-O-N-E. -E. Uh, it's expensive, I use very little of it, but it has been effective against uh, st Japanese stilt grass. Um, you uh, need to mow it, uh, you need to not let it uh, uh, go to seed. Um, there are several things that you can do chemically, physically, uh, and uh, uh, culturally. It, it is a real problem in, in some communities in Maryland. Okay, um, and let's see. Um, I think you mentioned a, a, a UD testing area. And, uh, oh yeah, there's a grass, a grass experimental area on the campus up at University of Delaware, where they are, are uh, conducting tests into, into different grass types, different seed types, seed mixtures. Um, there are so many different types of, uh, of mixtures for seeds. Uh, again, you have to look at how much time you want to spend mowing your grass, uh, how much effort you want to put in, whether you have an irrigation system. All these things uh, determine the type of grass that, that you want to grow. I mean, there may be people who want to grow zoysia uh, who, who uh, these are people, if you go to Florida in the wintertime, what do you care whether your lawn is brown? You might, <laughs> um, so therefore, you know, it, it's a personal thing about what kind of mixture you, you want to have. Um, you can go to a lawn and garden center, and I would recommend that, that Clark, uh, Clark Steed is one that has a lot of different seeds. There are, there are a couple others. Um, that, that uh, uh, you look for a seed mixture for Delaware. I know Southern States has one. I think uh, maybe, um, uh, I'm not sure about the others, um, uh, but uh, uh, look for a, a, a seed mixture for Delaware. Yeah, that was a related question about that. Also, um, the question about the, the uh, 
area at UD, um, whether it was open to the public. Megan has answered that in the chat. She said it is not currently open to the public right now. Oh, darn. Yeah. Um, I, I know so they also have, they also do a, a, a flowers up there as well. They um, do experiments with uh, uh, growing different types of uh, flowers, different types of annuals. And that, would, that would be something to, to see as well. And on the subject of the seed, the seeds, um, the mixtures of seeds, um, the ones that you recommended, somebody had asked if there was a, a brand or a bag that you could buy that already had that mixture or if you should buy those seeds separately and mix them yourself. You can do both. Uh, but if, 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 if it's first time, uh, I would recommend getting a, um, 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 an already mixed uh, something already mixed cultivar. Um, you, you, um, you, I would not recommend doing what I've done, and I've done experiments in lawn in seeds. So I, I've put down in, in in the ten years we've almost ten years that we've lived here. I think I've put down oh four or five different types of seed. <laughs> so my lawn is is eclectic. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I pretty much stuck with uh, uh, the Statesman brand uh, from uh, Southern States lately. Uh, it's, a, it's a decent mix. Um, you can go on, as a matter of fact, you could go on Amazon and look at all the different types. Um, uh, Lesco is another good brand. Um, unfortunately, they used to have a place in Dover, uh, but now you have to go to Bear, up to Bear, to the Lesco place in Bear. Um, where they have, uh, um, uh, where they, they do their, they're mostly uh, kind of whole, wholesale slash retail, but you can find everything for your lawn at, at that place. Um, uh, I, I just, I don't want to recommend one different kind because everybody, you know, it's, everybody's different. Everybody wants, if you have children and you want them running back and forth across your lawn, then you'll want something a little tougher. Um, and if you go to a seed place and ask, tell them what you want it for, I want recreation, and they'll recommend one kind of grassy. If you say, I want a show place grass, something that comes up nice and deep green, they'll recommend something else. So I'm at a dilemma to do any, recommend, any kind of recommendation as, as something being the best, or, or I know what's good for me and, and the type of soil I have, uh, uh, you, you have to go through that process. And we have quite a few questions on the topic of um, lawn renovation, reseeding, overseeding those areas. Um, so somebody wants to know if you were to wipe out your lawn with um, glyphosate um, and then you still have weed seeds in your soil, is that going to prevent those weed seeds from germinating? Or are they going to come right back? Um, if you... Um it depends on what weeds you're talking about, okay? We'll always have weeds. Weed is a weed because it, 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 these, these um, plants produce thousands upon thousands of seeds. They're, they're destined to, to um, plague us, I guess. Um, but if it's broadleaf, you can, you know, there's, it's relatively easy to get rid of, uh, of most of the broadleaf weeds. If it's uh, Bermuda grass, if it's, if it's wire grass, then you're going to have to, I would recommend tilling your soil, turning it over, exposing the, the um, uh, roots, um, killing that, waiting a couple weeks, see if anything comes back and then kill it again. Okay. Um, that's probably, uh, it's as close to a way to get rid of uh, that particular pest as I've seen. Um, timing is also important. Uh, I know it sounds silly to say this, but you can't kill a weed that is dead. <laughs> there are times of the year when that weed is growing, that's when you kill it. When it's, when it's, when it's the most pestful, when it's the, most, the biggest pest, that's the time to kill it because it's taking in moisture, it's taking in um, chemicals, in order to kill it, it will die. If you have weeds that have gone dormant, you can't kill it. It's already dead. So a lot of it is timing. Again, um, 
uh, do your best to kill what you have or, or get rid of the debris, um, put in organic matter, um, and then uh, put in a decent grass seed, a good grass seed, uh, keep it moist, hope for the best. Uh, over the next few years, you will have to get into a regime of beginning to, to mitigate weeds in the spring. Either, you know, when the forsythia bloom, make sure you get your pre-emergent down. Okay, a couple weeks after that, make sure you get your broadleaf control down. Uh, and do this hab habitually and, and until someone comes up with a grass cultivar that is uh, glyphosate resistant, we're going to have weeds. Okay. I, I, I know I didn't properly, I'm not sure I answered that properly, but that, that's the best I can do. Well, I think you kind of answered this next, uh, this other question, which was somebody asking what order should you do the, you know, the weeding, weed removal and the reseeding or the lawn renovation. So what would be the order that you would do these? And I think, I think you kind of just answered that, but if you want to. Uh, I would kill it, till it, okay? Um, add organic matter where you can, um, uh, uh, seed evenly, um, uh, and then um, uh, make sure you keep it moist, either by um, a salt hay or, or uh, making sure you have a, a working uh, sprinkler system to keep that seed moist. That, that would that would probably be the methodology that, that, that I would use. And another related weed question, um, is there anything you should do about crabgrass in your lawn at this time? At this time, um, depending on what else you want to do in your lawn, um, there are, uh, uh, you can spot spray it. Uh, you can also um, uh, uh, add a pre-emergent if, you, if, you if you're not seeding. Um, um, but usually um, using um, a pre-emergent in the spring, and if you really have a, really have a bad crabgrass problem, you can take that pre-emergent and spread it out over a couple applications. So it lasts a little bit longer. Say, when the forsythia bloom, put down half an application, okay? Then wait a couple weeks, put down your broadleaf, and then wait a couple weeks and put down the other half of your pre-emergent. This will extend the effectiveness of the pre-emergent out uh, into uh, the, 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 the more summery months, uh, you know, like now. But again, uh, uh, the key to, to crabgrass, I believe, is, is effective pre-emergent, use of pre-emergent. And there are some you know, chemicals that, that uh, uh, are specifically for uh, uh, quinclorac is one, Q-U-I-N-C-L-O-R-A-C, quinclorac uh, is a chemical that, that you can spot spray crabgrass with. And then um, talking about overseeding, someone wanted to know what's the difference between overseeding and slit seeding? Uh, slit seeding, it's just, slit seeding is the methodology, okay? You, you would put the, the seed in a, in a, in a slitter, uh, in a, um, um, yeah, in a seed slitter, which would cut a seed, um, a slit into the lawn, and then the seed drops from, from that. Uh, overseeding would be putting the seed on, on, on top of, say, top dressing or on top of your soil. See, it's just, it's just methodology. I mean, how you put your seed down, whether with a, a, broad, with, with a roto uh, spreader or with a slit seeder, it, it puts the seed on the ground. And then a related overseeding question, um, how do you add the seed to the existing lawn? That's, those are a couple of methods, right? Um, how much should you add if you're overseeding um, and how do you help it germinate? Um, well, to help it germinate by making sure the temperature is correct, making sure that you're, you're within the, the uh, parameters for when the seed germinates. Um, on the back of your seed bag, it should tell you how much seed to put down per thousand square feet if you're overseeding or if you're uh, putting seed down for the first time. Usually, um, off the top of my head, I think it's something somewhere around three 
to five pounds for overseeding usually, but check the back of the bag. It will tell it, it will tell you. I mean, if you have an area that is very sparse, then you'll probably want to use more. If you have fairly thick and, and you just want to add uh, a little bit more, uh, closer to three pounds per thousand square feet. Okay, um, and a another question, um, how many days do you need to keep the soil moist to germinate the seeds? Uh, usually it's, uh, uh, again, ballpark 10 to 14 days. Uh, make sure, you know, if the seed is kept moist, you'll, you'll see the little buggers coming up. And again, it depends on the seed. Some seeds germinate quicker, some seeds germinate slower. This information will be on the back of the bag. And then someone asked, uh, how do you manage clover that's coming in from the neighbor's yard? <laughs> um, a clover. Um, some people like clover. I mean, it does attract bees. It's like good for it. bees. Uh, but again, if, if, if you don't want it in your lawn, uh, it's very difficult to dig up. Um, that, that, that's a, 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 a physical practice. It's very difficult to keep up. Um, but uh, I believe there's some chemicals that, that will mitigate your clover. Um, uh, usually, the, the, the if you go to the University of Delaware website um, uh, that identifies weeds, it's in the bibliography, down at the bottom of the bibliography, it, it, uh, it will identify the weed and it will tell you the chemicals used to mitigate it. Uh, most broadleaf weeds, uh, it's 2,4-D um, and dicamba mixture. But be careful with dicamba because um, it's not good around trees. You don't want to you don't want to put it in the area of trees. Okay. Um, also, triclipper that was mentioned in my presentation uh, is another one. Um, it's it's good for, for a lot of broadleafs, but don't put it around trees. Okay. And then here's a question about soil. Um, someone said that they have very clay. Uh, intense soil with a lot of rocks and they are actually bringing in some topsoil to add um, but they want to do a soil test so they want to know if they should mix the old soil with the new soil to do the soil test. Oh that's a good question. Um, ooh, I think I, I would take my soil test with the native soil okay um, without um, uh, mitigating it with uh, because what you end up getting is it literally is a false positive because there is in the soil test uh, one of the um, indicators of fertility is a percent organic matter which is listed in a box below that that uh, uh, chart that I, I, I pinpointed uh, if you did bring in topsoil with compost you would you would skew that okay and you don't want to you, I don't think you want to do that um, so I would uh, take my native soil for the soil test and then, you know, do, do what you're going to do and follow your toil, soil test samples and then three years do another test. And then uh, someone else um, down from the beach area wants to know if you have any tips for growing grass down near the, uh, near the beach. Uh, is your soil sandy? I mean, I was, if you have sandy soil, um, you're not going to hold moisture enough to, to, to really grow a, a stand of grass. Uh, I would recommend uh, mitigating that with, with uh, uh, organic matter, topsoil, uh, before you start growing grass. Sand, especially beach sand, which is, is very dry. Uh, if, I mean, I'm, if I'm not, it's not like builder sand. Um, it won't hold enough moisture to, to, to uh, support uh, healthy root growth root growth. So I, I, if you wanted to grow it on very sandy soil, uh, I would bring in compost or topsoil or lawn soil. And uh, Steve, I believe, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, but I believe zoysia is a good uh, grass choice for sandy soil. Zoysia, yeah, zoysia will grow almost anywhere. It's very, very aggressive. If you have an, if you put in zoysia and you have a neighbor with a fescue lawn, you, you may have a problem. <laughs> Zoysia is 
it, it, it's easy to, you, you, you sow it with plugs, so it's easy to get in sandier soil. It's easier than trying to, to, to put a zoysia grass lawn into, into um, say, clay soil. That, that would be almost impossible. But uh, yeah, that's, that, that, yeah, I didn't think of that. Thanks, Debbie. And I think there's only one question left. If I missed anybody, um, you can go ahead and put it in the chat now. But the only other one I, I saw was when you um, showed the slide with the diagram of your yard with the circles and everything. Uh, somebody asked, what, what did the colors mean? Was there like a color code to that diagram? Uh, the, the lighter green was, the darker green was, was lawn area and the, the lighter green was um, flower bed. And uh, I have a, a, a shade garden off the one side. So, but uh, I, uh, I, I like, uh, I mean, I, 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 I love gardening, but I, I like other things well. So I, uh, uh, every year I try to dig another flower bed, uh, trying to get uh, uh, my lawn down to, to 15,000 square feet. So, so I, I can only, I only have to go buy one bag of stuff. <laughs> So the lighter green was flower beds and, and such. The black was driveway. Okay, um, I think that'll answer your question. And Steve, do you mind if I um, make your presentation into a PDF and send it out with the follow-up? So people, a lot of people are asking for a copy of the presentation. No, I don't mind at all. Uh, okay, I thought, you so, would, I thought that you'd do that anyway. Do you want me to send you another one? Um, no, I have it. I think I can, I can do what we did. Okay. Those things we talked about. Um, okay. And um, the, the uh, follow-up question about the color coding, the, the, they wanted to know what the red circles meant on your, on your um, lawn diagram. Red circles. I don't remember red circles. Remember. Yeah, there were some circles with the X's in them and that on your diagram. Oh, there were trees. Trees, okay. Yeah, they're, they're trees. I've actually put in a few more trees since then too. <laughs> trees and flower beds, baby. I know, I love trees. <laughs> um, so I don't think there's there are any new questions. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to fill out the evaluation. I put it in the chat, the link. You can go ahead and do that now. Um, also, I will be sending out a follow-up email later. Um, as we said, I will attach this presentation um, as a PDF to your um, email. And also, I will include the link to the evaluation if you just don't have time to do that right now. Um, so if that's everything, I want to thank everybody for, everybody for coming and um, be looking for that follow-up email. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and sign off. Thank you, Steve. You have thank you, Debbie. Questions? Thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Thank, thank you, All Steve. Take it easy. Okay, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Megan.